Bene, gentilissimi, eh, riprendiamo eh, la sessione pomeridiana. Abbiamo altre due relazioni e, e poi anche avremo spazio per commenti, domande, curiosità. Ora, ehm, ora da, darò, do la parola al collega Dimitar Veselinov Dimitrov dell'Università di Plovdiv, il quale eh, espone la sua relazione, Venice and the Mare Maius, eh, XIII-XV secolo, quindi eh, Venezia e il Mar Nero. Prego, collega. Grazie. Dear ladies and gentlemen, first allow me to express my sincere gratitude to all the organizers of this wonderful conference for inviting me here. It is my honor and pleasure to present my communication, which is dedicated to Venice and the Mare Maio, so Mar Nero. And the Venetian sense of the Black Sea. Non narat, non seminat, non vendemiat. That's how medieval people used to perceive the Venetian. He plows not, he sows not, he reaps not. Built in the sea and totally without vines and cultivated fields, that's how the Dutch Giovanni Soranzo described his city in 1327. This is an example of a city condemned in order to survive, to obtain everything from the sea trade. Venice married the sea and tried like a new Poseidon to capture and rule all over it. Venice longing for the sea, her senso del mare led her to the Mediterranean Northeast Periferia. The Exunus Pontus, or the hospitable sea, which Venice slightly turned from periphery to a focal point. In fact, between the 13th and the 15th century, Black Sea contact zone has been connected and integrated through its intrinsic maritime structures into the global nautical and trade network run by Venice in Genoa. This long durée period was marked by tectonic events that changed the history of Eurasia, Eurasia, the capture of Constantinople by the Crusaders in 1204, and the formation of Latin Romania, Tatar Mongol conquest in Asia and Europe in the 20s and 40s of the 13th century, the foundation of the powerful Mongol empires of the south, the so called Ilkhanate, and the north, the Golden Horde. It ends with the Ottoman conquests of Byzantium and the regions of the Black Sea in 1453 and 1475, and the gradual ousting of the Italian maritime republics from their former factories with the closure of the Black Sea by the Ottomans in its economic sense. Throughout this dynamic period of intense contacts and interactions, the Black Sea region attained great importance and played a key role being the hub of the international maritime commercial traffic in the European world economy, or the Weltwirtschaft, as Fernand Brodeau has called it. Thus, the Black Sea became an inviting area for the protagonists in the exchange process, the mariners and the merchants from Venice and Liguria. They evaluated the great importance for commercial communications between Western Europe and Central Asia and started calling it Mare Maius, Mar Maggiore, Gran Mare. Exinus Pontus quos quot vulgariter appellamus Mare Maius. It was first attested in the end of the 12th century, this name Mare Maius. And one of the Romanian historians, Giorgi Bratiano, uh, called Mare Maius in this period, Black Tornant or focal point of the international trade. So, in my communication, I'm going to present the main political, administrative, navigation and merchant aspects of Venetian presence in Mare Maius. 
the beginning. When the Venetians first entered the Black Sea, did the Italian traders have the opportunity to enter the Exynos Pontus before 1204? And did they even seek such a thing? Proponents of the thesis about the early penetration of Western Europeans in the Black Sea refer primarily to the series of Huisuvus issued by the Byzantine emperors in favor of the Italian maritime republics in the 12th century. The first one of these Huisuvus dates from 1082 and was provided by the emperor Alexius Pervi Comnenus to the Venetians. However, the Black Sea region does not appear to be a free exchange zone, neither in it nor in the next seven Huisuvus granted to the Republic of San Marco in the 12th century. Specifically, the Axinus Pontus was designated as an accessible trade area only in the last privilege bestowed on Serenissima in November 1198 by Emperor Alexius III from the dynasty of the Angles. For the first time in this Kosovo, the Black Sea in its particular Sorry. For the first time in this Kosovo, the West Black Sea coast and the Black Sea as a whole was mentioned. The long silence on the privileges of the Italian access to the Black Sea seems to explain why prominent researchers such as Bratiano, Michel Bauer, Sergei Karpov insist that the documents in question did not cancel the total ban on Western Europeans to sail into the Black Sea area. According to Sergei Karpov and Michel Bauer, Byzantium controlled the Black Sea area completely in the second half of the 12th century. The famous Huisovus granted to the Venetians in that century did not really sanction effective penetration on their part into the Black Sea, which as a whole remained an internal Byzantine lake. No Venetian or Genoese notarial contract from that time names the Black Sea as the target of a commercial expedition. The reason for this cannot be explained only by the protective <coughs> policy of the Byzantine emperors. The direction of the principal international trade rules bypassed Mare Maios, which in that time was still Exynos Pontus, and crossed in the harbors of the Eastern Mediterranean. The 13th century starts a new age, from Mare Clausum to Mare Maius. However, this situation did not change drastically after 1204. In the document Partizio Romaniae, Crusaders showed no real interest in dividing among themselves the Byzantine Black Sea ports beyond Sinope. The Venetians also did not hurry to establish trading centers in the Black Sea area. The Black Sea markets were of secondary interest to Italian traders. According to David Jacobi, the Black Sea and the Mediterranean constituted two separate commercial regions before 1204, as in the following decades too. Each of these regions partly handled different goods and had its own navigation conditions, trade patterns, and shipping networks. It's true that Venetians gained free access to the Black Sea in 1204, and they made several attempts to navigate its waters between 206 and 250, a period during which they dominated the Latin Empire economically. However, considering the surviving commercial contracts, the activity of the Venetian merchants into the Black Sea seems very modest. From the 25 contracts drawn up in Constantinople before 1250, only three make reference to the Black Sea. The investments they mention relate to modest sums. 100, 25, and 2 perpers, which seems to indicate a very limited activity. 
the merchants conserve use ships of small tonnage, like Sandaun, for example, and collaborated with local traders. That, that, that does not indicate a special effort by the Venetians to establish a monopoly of trade with Pontic regions. David Jacobi tried to demonstrate that the economy of Latin Constantinople remained flourishing even if the finances of the Latin emperor were weak, and that Venetian merchants profited directly from the opening of the Black Sea. Constantinople found itself at the intersection of two commercial networks, one in the hands of the Venetians, linked Constantinople with the West, and the other one was controlled by the Greeks and the Seljuks, who both made treaties with Venice. The Venetians in Constantinople thus became the intermediaries between two networks without having themselves the obligation of penetrating into the Black Sea. This avoided a dispersion of their forces in a time when they had to set up their domination over the Aegean and Marian territories granted to them by the Partizio Romaniae of 1204. The situation slightly begins to change from the half of the 13th century. And there is an evidence from Marco Polo's famous work, Il Milione, where drawing on his father and uncle's first trip eastwards, Marco Polo mentions how Nico and Matteo arrived unconcerned in Constantinople with their <coughs> goods. There, they decided to enter Lo Gran Mare, with the ambition to make more profit. To this end, they purchased a multitude of jewels and set off on their ship to the Black Sea port of Soudaya. This information first reveals one of the main Venetian trade routes in the Black Sea in the middle of the 13th century, the route to the Tatar Mongols via Black Sea. But it was not only a transit route, as this episode of Marco Polo's book perfectly exemplifies. The pivotal role that Lo Gran Mare gradually began to play as an intermediary in the long range cross border trade conducted by the Serenissima citizens. A key point in this story described by Marco Polo is there the, the anticipation of his father and his uncle about the profit that they were expected to gain from the Black Sea trade. So they decided to make extra investments on the Black Sea market. So from the middle of the 13th century, the prospects of a new market niche have emerged in the Marimayos Basin for the merchants from the Republic of San Marco. The analysis of the documents for the time between 1204 and 1261 shows that this period definitely played a role in the development of Venetian commercial entrance into the Black Sea, giving it greater depth and durability in a region far distant to the then Western European region. This is the stage where valuable information and experience have been accumulated, which gradually turned the Exynos Pontus into the great and familiar sea for the Italians, or <clears throat> the way they used to call it, Mare Maios. It is within this time frame that at least Serenissima merchants have certainly begun to settle in some of the leading Black Sea ports and take up positions in local trade. But perhaps the most important consequence of what happened between 1204 and 1261 was the one trade battle for the Constantinople by the Western Europeans, and above all, by the Venetians. Taking over the huge Constantinople market is crucial. During this period, the change of the trade guard in Constantinople and the Straits, which came under the care of the Italians, was legitimized.
Then we have the next phase, the so-called the Great Shift after the middle of the 13th century. In the second half of the 13th century, the Mongol conquest, which has been consolidated along the northern coast of the Black Sea, opened new opportunities for Italian merchants and greatly expands the field of their commercial operations. As Giorgi Bratiano emphasized, the meeting of Italian traders and the Mongols is a capital event in the 13th century. It inaugurates direct trade and maritime links between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean and leads to the integration of these two previously distinct networks. The Pax Mongolica protects the movement of goods in the world of the steppe and allows Italian merchants to establish their trading stations on the shore of the Black Sea. And at the terminus of the two fundamental routes, the Silk Route and the Spice Route. The Mongols captured Baghdad in 1258, the last crusader centers in Palestine and Syria fell to the Mamluks in 1291. The popes imposed an embargo on the trade of Roman Catholics with Mamluk Egypt, and this fact also contributed to the shift of the direction of trade routes. The meeting of the Italian merchants and the Mongols presumes two conditions. The existence of easily practicable grand intercontinental itineraries and the establishment of Western trading ports at their limits. Posts which serve as intermediaries between the Mediterranean and Asian networks. As a result, the Black Sea region was connected to the flow of trade on the Silk Road and on the Spice Route, a situation which is probably unique in all of history and certainly during the Middle Ages. In that time, the Italian merchant invasion in the Black Sea started to grow up. The trade with oriental products, which used to go through Iraq, is diverted towards the Black Sea, resulting in a change to the major intercontinental trade routes. The division of Mongol territories into two rival Khanates, the Ilkhanate in Persia and the Golden Horde, both equally open to Western merchants, thus stimulating competition competition and rivalry between Venice and Genoa. The other major event is the complete opening of the Black Sea to Western merchants. The Treaty of Nymphaeon from March 1261 authorizes the Genoese to develop their trade there without any hindrances on the condition of giving free access in all the territories of the Byzantine Empire. In 1268, the Venetians, who were expelled from the Black Sea Basin after 1261, in their turn were authorized by the Emperor Michael VIII Palaeologos to trade in the Black Sea. When the Byzantine Empire was restored in 1261, the Venetians could not trade in the Black Sea for several years, having been excluded by the Genoese Byzantine Treaty of 1261. But as early as 1265 and 1268, Venice gained the right to continue privileged trade in Byzantium and to sail unrestricted all over the Black Sea. The Treaty of Venice with Byzantium provided mutual promises on the part of both the Venetians and Genoese not to assault each other in the Black Sea nor on land. Private navigation of the Venetians developed quickly from 1260 onwards. That led to another great change, the so-called Seco Esposivo, or the Italian Trecento in the Black Sea. After the fall of Acre 
and the loss of the Latin states in Syria and Palestine, the papacy forbade all commercial relations with Egypt. The first half of the 14th century is therefore the peak of the trade in the Black Sea area. The Venetian Genoese War of 1294 and 1299 was closely linked to Byzantium and the Black Sea. It resulted in the strengthening of Genoese position in the Empire and the Black Sea and harmed the Venetian political and commercial interests in the region. In their quest to regain the lost position in the region, the Venetians were very active. The Byzantine Venetian treaties of October, October the 4th, 1302, uh, and March the 7th, 1303, overturned the ban of Venetian access to the Black Sea. So they could now run free trade again, facing the fierce competition of Genoa and being in constant collisions with Byzantium. So Venice needed reliable allies and partners in the Black Sea area, such as it found in the face of the Bulgarian Tsardom and partly in the Tatar Golden Horde. It was the time when the first trading posts of the Italians were established. These were Kaffa on the Crimean shore, granted to the Genoese by the Khan of the Golden Horde, between 1270 and 1275, Vicina and later Kilia and Likustomo at the mouth of the Danube River, Tana, major trade center for the Genoese from 1289 and for the Venetians officially from 1332. And of course, Trebizond, frequented by Genoese merchants from the 80s, of the 13th centuries, and later the, <clears throat> the town was the seat of Genoese and Venetian quarters set up in 1314 and in 1318. These large Western establishments are surrounded by secondary ones. For example, Mon Castro, nowadays Belgorod Nostrovsky, to the west of the Black Sea, also Cembao and Sodaya on the Crimean littoral, also Vosporo and Bosporos. Matrega, and near the Strait of Kerch. Sevastopoli on the eastern side, Samastri, Sinope, and Simisu on the northern coast of Anatolia, which collect local products and bring them to the principal Black Sea masters, such as Genoa and Venice. The long-distance trade organized by Western traders is completely connected with the coasting trade undertaken by the local merchants such as Greeks, Armenians, or Tatars. Very soon, the Genoese created a network of big and small trading stations all over the Black Sea shores. And at the end of the 13th century and in the early 14th century, the flourishing state of these Western standing posts facilitates exchange between the Mediterranean world and the Mogul steppe. However, from the middle of the 14th century, a turning point came. This was the Black Sea and the crisis of the mid 14th century, when a complex of political, military, and economic factors hindered or favored the movements of goods changes that occurred after the Black Death of 1347, 1350. Also, we have the subsequent discords and disintegration of the Golden Horde in the 60s, 80s of the 14th century. Italian trade at first was restricted or limited, but gradually recovered, however losing its amplitude, but better adapted to deal with local goods and wares of the Black Sea area. The concurrence was severe between the Genoese and the Venetian traders, and numerous were the conflicts with the local powers. The favorable period of exchange when the products of the Far East are united with agricultural and primary local materials ends with the closure of Mongol, Mongol routes to Western merchants. That happened from the 
middle of the 14th century. So now I pay some attention on the establishment of the Venetian network administrative model. Roberto Lopez, in his famous paper, talks about Venice and Genoa, two styles, but both of them were successful according to him. So what was the Venetian style in creating administrative network in the Black Sea region? The key words here are centralization and cohesion. So Venice was able to create a highly centralized colonial organism in Romania in which the metropolis was able to manage control and use everything and everyone in search of maximum success and prosperity. The Venetian commune has achieved widespread institutionalization of its trading structures in Romania with the help of a mandated administration like Bible, rector, consuls, colleagues of finances, lawyers, etc. They were all elected by the Great Council or the Senate of the Republic. So in the Black Sea area, the Venetian structures were controlled and coordinated by the administration of the Venetian Bible in Constantinople. However, the Venetians created smaller administrative units, such as consulates, in some of the Black Sea ports. The first one is that of Tana, which in actually is in the Azov Sea, however, plays a very important role and is closely connected with the Black Sea trade. Tana, the most remote of the Venetian trading posts, was founded in the 1320 or 1330s, in the place where the sea routes ended and the caravan roads began inland in Asia along the routes controlled by the Golden Horde. Surrounded by Horde possessions and the Tatars, Tana felt the consequences of the conflicts. The first mention of a consul in Tana is from January 1326, and the earliest mention of a voyage of galleys under communal operation to Tana dates from 1322, through private Venetian ships that were visiting Tana much earlier, however. In 1332, the Venetian trading station in Tana received extra territoriality and special rights and privileges as a result of a treaty with Khan Uzbek. In the vision of the Venetians, Tana was a place that attracted great attention due to the strong gains, the strategic control of the area with a view on the Eastern world and a place in contrast to the Genoese Kafa. The second key zone of the Venetian presence in the Black Sea is the Trapezunt Empire. There were large factories of the Genoese and the Venetians there, and the beginning of the Italian penetration of the territory of the Trebizond Empire dates back to the 70s and 80s of the 13th century. It was mainly commercial in nature and was not yet a form of establishing political dominance or governing cities or any area of the empire. The only episode when the Venetians and even more put forward the idea of replacing the power of Trebizond of the Emperor Alexei III with the reign of their own rector with the constant and support of the local barons in 1376 ended in failure. First surviving in Latin translation Chrysovu of 1319 from Trebizond emperors, the Venetians, the Venetians were granted the following rights, free entry into the empire, protection of the personality and property of merchants throughout the state, the completion of a friendly trade transaction subject to the payment of commercials, the use of their own measures and weights 
possession of a certain territory with the right to establish churches and other structures. Another important Venetian trading post was in the Bulgarian Sardom, and it was Il Porto del Zagora, or the port of Bulgaria, that was the town of Varna. A few words about Venetian navigation in the Mare Maios. Since the Venetians were pushed out of the Black Sea by the Inferno Treaty of 1261 and lost their advantage and positions there, they tried to compensate the lost positions <coughs> by creating maybe the most advanced and secure system of navigation, the convoy of the galleys, or the so-called Muda, sailing under communal regulation. Number of galleys and type of operations for Romanian Black Sea for those years from 1320 to 1334, you may see most of those sailings were organized and regulated by the commune itself. However, <coughs> communal operations were abandoned in the end of the 20s of the 40th century partly in order to increase private profits and partly because of administrative difficulties which developed when the commune itself operated the ships. That's why the commune started turning over to private individuals. Those were the regulated voyages of the Venetian convoy of merchant galleys to the Black Sea harbors, as you may see. The main harbors were Tana, Trebizond, Kaffa, Simisu, Sinope, Mor Castrum. These are uh, the number of merchant galleys serving the line to the Mare Maios, the number of vessels, Tana, 194, during the 14th and 15th centuries. Besides the Muda, we have also the free voyages of ships privately owned and operated in the so-called Navigazione Libera, as Professor Rosato has called it. These were private navigations with round ships. And this is a kind of finding that made a real archaeological sensations that was found on the last summer a sunken western Mediterranean, possibly Venetian route ship from the 13th, 14th century, it was found near Varna in Bulgaria's Black Sea zone. It was discovered by a large-scale underwater archaeology project, the so-called the Black Sea MAAP, and considered to be of unique value. And finally, a few words about the commercial exchange. Of course, it's all about grains and wheat, the so-called fromentum de mari maiori, which was very important for the Republic, because navigatio tane et maris maioris de quibus partibus nostri mercatoris consequebantur maximum utilitatem et vocrum. some data about the price of the Black Sea wheat in Venetian grossi per, per one stadio, 83 liters per one stadio. And this is the price on the markets of the southern Black Sea towns of the grains from the, from the end of the 13th to the middle of the 15th century. In conclusion, Italian merchants and seafarers, and Venetians in particular, brought with them 
tested commercial techniques, a spirit of initiative and an energy which meant that the circulation of goods and merchandises was accelerated. All the regions of the Black Sea were invited to add their produce to the international trade dominated by the Italians, who became the indispensable intermediaries and middlemen among the various zones of Mare Maios. And the key words in conclusion, maximum utilitatem et lucrum, that's what the Venetian were striving for, and also provisio, inspectio, means control, centralization, and of course, they have to defend the honor of the commune or honor patria in Mare Maios. Grazie, grazie a Dimitar Veselinov Dimitrov eh, che ha, ci ha illustrato questo medioevo del, del Mar Nero con questa presenza veneziana prima e dopo il 1240, eh, Mar Nero insomma il, anche in senso geografico il punto estremo verso oriente e, e il luogo di, di contatto no? adesso si è stata rivalutata la via della seta quindi è stata una fortuna per il commercio italiano l'arrivo dei, dei mongoli dei tartari no? Questo. Quindi. <ride> bene eh, andiamo avanti l'ultima relazione eh, abbiamo qui Reinhard Glutzmann dell'Università di Haifa e la relazione intitolata The Nobility's Withdrawal from Ship Opening During the 16th Century. Dunque un altro argomento, direi mitico, cioè quanto e come si sono ritirati dal commercio i patrizi veneziani. Collega, prego. Mi dispiace eh, di presentare in inglese, in, in inglese, però dopo possiamo continuare la discussione anche in italiano. Ok. Uh, the decline in Venice supremacy at sea uh, largely co corresponds to the ruling class dwindling participation in shipping and seaborne sea trade over the 15th and 17th centuries. According to Alberto Tenenti, the fall of Venice's key trading center of Negroponte in 1470 marks the beginning of a change in the attitude of the patricians towards Venetian superiority at sea. The collective conviction in the myth of Venice's unchallenged maritime prowess was shaken. 30 years later, one of the captains of the sea, Sebastiano Moro, acknowledged the incapacity of the Republic to produce an armada large enough to successfully head off the Turks. In the following decades, Venice fleet would monitor the enemy but avoid clashes at any cost. This was exactly the reverse of the tactics of previous centuries. Up until the end of the 15th century, from his youth, the typical Venetian patrician was engaged in the search for profit through commerce. Since the majority of the wealthy patricians were merchants and investors in shipping, they protected their interests from unwanted competition, whether foreign or domestic, by introducing a complex system of privileges. But in the course of four decades, however, a great many no uh, noblemen dropped out of the race and parceled out an increasing quota of their former activity to third parties. The upshot was that by the 1540s, Venice trading community in the Levant was operated almost exclusively by agents of non-noble origins, mostly citizens and citizen subjects. Likewise, the revival in the private shipping sector after 1544 was largely the result of a new funds sea fund in by entrepreneurs from social groups previously excluded from this area of business. The welcome influx meant that by 1550, the city's fleet boosted more round ships, either owned or co-owned by non-noblemen than ever before in the Venetian history. And it meant that for the first time, the commoners were in the, front front, in the, front for, in the forefront uh, of commercial shipping 
most lucrative sector. This new spirit of enterprise driving trade and shipping activity was largely responsible for the commercial heyday that preceded the Battle of Lepanto. The general trend underway is corroborated by mid-16th century le legislation. The registers of the Senate issued fewer and fewer decrees strictly concerning commercial navigation. If senators continue to use traditional formulas relating to the reputation and honor of the Venetian state, the more strictly economic issues were now as much related to the industry uh, or investment in the mainland and fortification of the colonies. The discourse of, on commercial navigation tended to express individual apprehensions rather than a general concern to organize the sector. Is it possible to quantify the, so the socio-economic change in the, in the composition of the city's shipping milieu? For what part of the nobility did the senso di mare start to make less sense? A key element for understanding this shift in the acknowledge, uh, is to acknowledge that the gradual withdrawal of the patricians from shipping had already begun several decades before they were formally replaced by other social groups. While this phenomenon had already manifested itself after the fall of Negroponte, the trend accelerated in the first decade of the 16th century. The diarist Hieronimo Priuli presented a convincing analysis of the causes and effects of the Portuguese discoveries at the turn of the century. In his view, the Cape route to India would reduce the Republic's volume of trade, and consequently, the Venetian nobility would reduce its investment in the seafaring and shipbuilding business and reroute its capital to the terra firma. According to Priuli, the reasons behind the Venetian invasion of the nearby Romania region in northern Italy in 1503 was to gain more land in a bid to make up for the losses of their income from trade at sea. This move inland precipitated the war of the League of Cambrai which marked a turning point in Venice's attitude towards mainland possessions. While scholars accept Priuli's analysis in principle, the extent of the patriciate's withdrawal from shipping and trade after the Portuguese discoveries is still under debate. Claire Jules de la Riviere recently provided numerical data on the composition of investors in the galley during the years of decline. The results are largely corroborated with Priuli's analysis. Her study shows that after, 15, uh, after uh, 15, uh, 15, one, uh, sorry, the number of investors in public navigation steadily dwindled with the corresponding increase in the number of their investment. From 1520, companies were generally composed of no more than two investors. A transition had occurred. Large companies made up of multiple investors were replaced by smaller ones with a limited number of backers sharing the available capital. Consequently, there were fewer patricians and an increasing number of cittadini involved in the system. From 1495 to 500, these numbers were more than 250. But half a century later, there were no more than 30 and all of them were members of a handful of family-based networks. This reduction in the number of patricians involved, involved confirmed the general oligarchic tendency that scholars attribute to the 16th century Venice, at least during the first half of the century and before this sector became obsolete in the 1550s. Some of the most influential patricians monopolized the profit to be made from trade at sea. In this new configuration, public galleys lost their traditional co collective dimension, corporate governments was no longer a reality. In this graph, uh, I show the, the general decline uh, or the fluctuations uh, in the number of ships and galleys uh, of ships of over 240 tons, uh, including the galleys, between 1480 and 15, 1559. Still, the general conviction that private shipping fared better in those years had so far prevented scholars from taking a more decisive stance 
on the full extent of the crisis in Venetian shipping as a whole. It is worthwhile reminding ourselves first of the historiographical context which, within which the prediction of, Veli of Venice resilience in the 16th century had emerged. In the early 20th century, what was at that time considered to be the decline of Venice and its merchant marine was ascribed to the great oceanic discoveries and the conquest abandon of the system of merchant galleys. While Albert H. Leibler may deserve pride of place in post-dating post the decline of the Mediterranean spice trade to a much later period, it was the work of Frederick C. Lane, first published in 1933, that provided substantial support for this thesis through his painstaking assessment of the Venetian merchant fleet and its changing capacity over the centuries. Lane stressed that the effect of the Venetian trade on the Portuguese discovery had frequently been misrepresented uh, thanks to the scholar scholarly failure to distinguish between long ships, galleys, and round ships. Historian confused the growth, or the, the growth or decline in the size of the galley convoys with that of Venetian shipping and spice trade as a whole. The decline of the merchant galleys, Lane concluded, was out of proportion relative to, the, to any reduction in Venetian commerce in the first half of the 16th century. Whereas Lane's conviction that the merchant galleys had been eventually superseded by private merchantmen in, line, in liner shipping is substantially correct, it's, it entirely dismissed the interdependence between both sectors of shipping economy. Thus, after all, it seems that the decline in the system of merchant galleys did indeed reflect a downturn in shipping across the board. And what I did in my research is, uh, I will go through it very briefly, I prepared ship lists uh, for snapshots, we can say, for each 10 years, including all categories above 240 uh, tons, 400 body, and uh, I present you with the, with the results here. This is the number of ships existing, and this is uh, some graph representing the, uh, the, the same, uh, but looking on capacity and not on uh, the numbers itself. The concepts of private and public in Renaissance Venice rhetorical discourse were not necessarily contradictory. The two sides colluded as eagerly as they competed for their share. True, they approached the same reality from two distinctly different points of entry. Because of the inevitable overlap, the public and private were per perceived not as opposing forces, but, but as entities in a constant dialectic. Thus, for example, many economic activities were said to benefit both the public sector and the private investors. The latter might even represent both spheres, and their identity was not an issue. Admittedly, some distinction was made be between public navigation and private navigation, but this was more a su subjective perception of these two sectors of shipping. That distinction did not mend op opposition, however, and it would be a mistake to overestimate it. Indeed, in a various situation, the rapport between public and private navigation was more a question of fluidity than rigidity. Besides, the maritime institution and administration that governed bond, both sectors of navigation were largely the same, such that one might find the same clerk dealing with both public and round ships uh, and, and galleys. This is particularly the case after 1516, when the Arsenal and the, and the Cinque Sabia la Mercancia assumed control over private navigation as well. Indeed, the complex scope of state intervention begs a more holistic analysis of shipping, one which acknowledges the overlap and interdependence of the various services involved in this industry, aspects discussed in several parts of the present study. An example of this approach might be the Jacobin Barbary with the extraordinary woodcut of the city uh, completed in 1500s, which allowed us to zoom out for a bird's eye view on the, of the whole and also study in microscopic detail all this maritime. In her 
topographical study on the patterns and the auctioneer of the galleys, Claire Jeux de la Riviere noticed many instances in which public and private navigation were often operated by the same circle of ship owners and investors. A significant proportion of the patrician who auctioned and operated merchant galleys actually had also large tonnage ships. And there are many examples for this. Um, on the other hand, there were other patricians who focused on owning large tonnage ships. The names of Francesco and Filippo Bernardo, Antonio Coco, um, and uh, Galeazzo Zancarwal, as well as the clan of the Mosto, do not appear among those who auctioned the galleys and probably did not take any significant role in their operation. With very few exceptions, the nobility held full control over public navigation until its definite decline. In the large tonnage sector, however, the picture that emerged is quite different. To judge from the snapshots of Venice's merchant marine afford, uh, afforded us through the ship list for the years 1480, 1490, 1599, 1509, 1520, 1530, and 1540, on the face of it, it seems that the aristocracy maintained control over 70 to 75 percent of the most lucrative sector of private shipping until the fifth decade of the 16th century. In 1480, for example, at least 23 out of 29 private round ships of over 240 tons were primarily owned by Venetian noblemen. Or at least this is what we know from the names of the owners. Of course, the, there is the question if these noblemen were operating from Venice or they were actually operating from the colonies. There are several examples which uh, it's clearly uh, Venetian noblemen according to the family names, but uh, the, the ships are coming from, uh, from Crete and from Corfu and other places. But if to make this very rough division, uh, this is what you see here between noblemen and, uh, and the others. Ten years later, the number was 20 out of 26, and in 1499, 31 out of 40, out of a to total of 29 uh, ships afloat in 1509, at least 21 were owned by Venetian noblemen. In 1520, 17 out of 21, and this is the general trend. Despite this continued commitment by the patrician, we must bear in mind, though, that the volume of activity, that is the size and gross tonnage of Venice's merchant marine, dropped significantly and the beginning, at the beginning of the 16th century and remained relatively low in the four decades to come. Hence, the gradual withdrawal of investment and participation in the city's uh, of the city's nobilities in the private sector of the merchant marine tallies with the decline in the system of merchant galley and parallel to a drop in trade. Again, the ship list reveal the shifts underway. We can notice a change in the names of the principal owners uh, in the list of 1549, indicated that the social composition of the shipping milieu had altered in the aftermath of the war with the Turks, 1537 to 1540. Out of 40 privately owned ships of over 400 body, only 19 were now the property of the Venetian noblemen, amounting to barely 45%. Although the higher ranking ship were still owned by the patrician class, it was wider citizenry, citizenry uh, and Venetian subject who powered the revival that came about in 1549, bringing a new spirit of enterprise and injecting private capital into the otherwise listless shipping economy. This is the division between uh, um, incompetency between owner, between noblemen and others, and we see that in, in this sense uh, there were uh, always more uh, uh, participation of uh, commoners in the competency of ships. In the years that followed, the entire shipping sector and the merchant class as a whole underwent a sweeping social transformation. Immigrants from the colonies seeking new opportunities in the capital were swelling the ranks of the cittadini class and thereby generating a formidable economic resource. 
Though a modest number of patricians continue to attend to commercial affairs, the economic foundations of the city's ruling class were truly transformed. One of the figures that represented the new spirit of the emerging shipping industry in the mid-16th century was the coffee's keeper, Captain Matthias Verghis, cited as Matteo Verga in Venetian sources, whose long career, at, la at least from 1509, as captain of local vessels of small and medium capacity, has been studied in depth by Gerasimus Bagratis. Verghis made numerous voyages between Venice and Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, he captained round ship Cornera, Owned, uh, joined, owned jointly by the Corner brothers and Tommaso Duodo. A second generation businessman, the Verghese family took part frequently and concurrently in numerous joint ventures for the transportation of local products from Corfu to Ottoman harbors. Following the Venetian Ottoman War, the said Matthias and his brother Demetrius relocated to Venice from where they kept an eye on their affairs having access to more re reliable intelligence and utilizing the services of a dense network of agents in key commercial points. They collaborated with members of the Marcello clan, as well as the Venier and the Contarini. In 1560, the Verghis brothers invested 15,000 ducats to build their own vessel of 900 botti at the Pegolotto shipyard in Boca del Rio di San Domenico in Venice. The carats were then divided equally between the Matthias between Matthias and his nephew, Johannes, Demetrius' son. Between 1560 and 1569, the ship made no fewer than nine commercial voyages from Venice to Cyprus and one to Ibiza. Similarly, a certain Stefano, son of Niccolò Taraboto, cittadino veneziano, earned a reputation as captain on board the Morecena and Ragazzona and the Cornera. In 1544, this Taraboto was made captain of the Barza di Comun, being the first known nobleman to be appointed to this prestigious position. After four years in public service, he returned to the private sector and captained the ship Riula del Banco from 1550. Concurrently, in 1544, Taraboto built his own round ship, named after him in partnership with his Venetian nobleman, Zaccaria, son of Barbon Morosini, and Benedetto, son of Niccolò Venier. There are more examples, but we will not go to this right now. Uh, clearly, the new entrepreneurship did not just step out of the blue. The centuries' coastal navigation and ownership of small and medium-sized vessels had been dominated by the lower class. In, uh, it is equally true that already in the 15th century, it was the norm to award sh uh, shares in ships to captain citizens or subjects of Venice. What is more difficult to assess, however, is the readiness of the lower classes to enter into this more ambitious maritime enterprise before 1544, and whether such initiatives were faced with resentment on the part of the nobility or by the authorities. To be sure, there were several exceptions, and one of the most prominent examples is a ship of 1,800 botti built and owned by a Manoli Calafato dalla Cania in the 1470s. This ship was drafted into the war fleet, and after the owner's death, was abandoned in Suda in Crete. Yet the tendency of the nobility to dominate the, this hazardous sector of ship owning can be, can be seen at large. The noble families continued to constitute the nucleus of the upper sector of commercial shipping in the first four decades of the 16th century. Thereafter, their relative importance in terms of number and gross tonnage decreased, certainly in, respect, in relative terms. While the mid-16th century saw a more or less balanced division in the ownership of roundships between the nobility and other social groups, the growing dominance of the latter became more evident in the end of the century. Ugo Tucci observed, observed that by 1622, among the representatives of the shipping industry who were negotiating the affairs of this sector with the Cinque Savi and Mercanzia, there were two cittadini and only a single nobleman. By 1677, not a single one of the 41 Parcenevoli taking part in the election of the body of the noble extraction was of noble extraction. The, over, the overall trend is therefore quite clear, and the decline in patrician involvement illustrates the very close rapport between shipping and trade. The circumstantial evidence is a strong enough indication that the last third of the 16th century 
may well have been a decisive through by no means total withdrawal of the Venetian nobility from banking, sea trade, and shipping in general. And notably, this drop in the number of nobl no noblemen take part in shipping activities run parallel with their declining presence in the commercial community at large. Bene, ringraziamo Reynard Glutzmann eh, anche per questa relazione, il tempo preciso, <ride> quindi non, non è servito qui l'avviso dei cinque minuti. E, mh, abbiamo sentito anche queste tesi molto interessanti, insomma di un 500 ancora più vivace di quanto si pensasse. A questo punto eh, sono, sono benvenuti commenti, commenti e domande e curiosità. <ride> commenti, <ride> prima di tutto. Commenti, One to you, uh, because uh, I do not know the, um, this, uh, this time and this society, uh, I am an historian of the Roman time, of Roman history. Uh, I, I would like to know if the prosopography of these owners is well known enough to distinguish if they are noblemen or not. As you know, we are very late from the Roman Empire, but in the Roman Empire, people in the first and second centuries AD could wear the same name as noblemen as they were descendants of their freedmen. Yes, uh, it's a very good question and a very problematic question and a big debate, um, which I knew will come. Um, it, it's, of course, it's a problem. Uh, there is, uh, in certain cases, a clear evidence that these noblemen were operating from, uh, from other places and not Venice, although they had uh, a nobleman the names were, were of noblemen, the Manolesso, Rousvier, others are clearly not uh, Venetians, uh, Venetian patricians. Uh, um, what, I, what is, regardless of, uh, of these uh, details, which has to be studied as a case-by-case -case study, there is no other way to do this, right? Uh, there is a clear evidence of, uh, of a change in the, in the ownership of, of, of ships. Uh, names that never before appeared and uh, which are not of noble origin, it's uh, unmistakable. So this data has to be refined and uh, still uh, worked on, uh, but uh, the, the picture at large is is a change, a dramatic change that we don't see before in the decades before 1544. Certo, certo, certo. Se non ci sono altre domande in aula, mi farei nuovamente a te perché imponi vari problemi insieme. Prima c'è una trasformazione strutturale della flotta veneziana con la fine delle galeazze di mercato. Dunque è normale che la partecipazione dei nobili all'affitto e al maneggio di, queste, eh, di, di questo tipo di navi diminuisce, visto che la base diminuisce. La, la, la seconda è interessante, che nell'ultima curva, era interessante di vedere delle fluttuazioni opposte 
per fra il, i padroni, fra i padroni delle, di tutte le navi insieme, con un aumento, fra una forma di aumento della partecipazione dei non nobili, perché prendono la responsabilità di navi più piccole, e invece più o meno eh, sono alla pari soltanto per le navi più grosse. E dunque c'è una gerarchia interna nei comandi che, che è interessante, però in, in modo più generale il problema è di sapere fino a che punto il possesso e la gestione di navi di trasporto nel Mediterraneo del Cinquecento è un segno indiscutibile dell'attività mercantile. Voglio dire che le attività commerciali che salgono sono quelle di finanza, di banca, e non sempre di partecipazione ai commerci, ai commerci. e che il trasporto marittimo eh, non è automaticamente l'attività la, la più redditizia. Ne, ne vediamo un segno di potere, di, di potenza di, di Venezia, però al limite prendere in affitto delle navi, cominciando dalle, dalle ragusane per esempio, dove i noli sono più bassi, più, che corrispondono più alla dimensione, alle necessità del traffico, può essere una scelta economica del tutto normale, soltanto si decentra il trasporto su marine secondarie. E lo verifichiamo ancora di più dopo, alla fine del Cinquecento, quando le navi olandesi, inglesi, e anziati che portano del grano non sono più delle navi di 400-500 tonnellate sono delle navi di 150 tonnellate più leggere meno costose con equipaggio più ridotti anche risparmio di mano d'opera però che più facilmente trovano delle merci da, per, il, traf, per il, traf, il viaggio di ritorno e, e mettiamo sono perfettamente com competitivi da questo punto di vista perché mettiamo il loro viaggio è stato pagato dal viaggio di andata <ride> e cercano bon, possono fare, rimanere per fare i corsari e lo fanno <ride> però mettiamo credo che sarebbe interessante di reinserire di rinunciare a questa visione troppo centrata sul la, il possesso delle marine, la costruzione delle grandi navi, navi e eh, la, la, vederci un, in, un indice della, della dinamica di un commercio. Allora, non so più perché sono cose che ho dimenticato. Quando hanno cominciato le sovvenzioni dell'amministrazione veneziana alla costruzione di grossi navi, dopo il 49 o prima? Perché negli anni 50-60 ricordo bene i discorsi di Ruggero Romano eh, sull'argomento, la costruzione di grosse navi per eh, un certo periodo viene sovvenzionata dall'amministrazione veneziana cioè, eh, per eh, costituire, cioè l'amministrazione ha ceduto al prestigio, cioè alla necessità di sostenere la, la costruzione di grosse navi che sono più costose a Venezia perché, eh, mettiamo gli olandesi, hanno del materiale di costruzione navale, eh, la legna e tutto, la, eh, e, tutto, e tutto il resto, ha molto miglior mercato perché il Baltico è una migliore fonte di approvvigionamento che il Mediterraneo. Dunque, dietro la tentazione, sono d'accordo con le tue, eh, le tue curve, eccetera, eccetera, però mi sembra che la cosa potrebbe essere rivisitata in un contesto, in un contesto più generale e, più, e meno un, di determinazione a senso unico. <laughs> Complicated to answer all of that, but uh, yes, absolutely, you said so many uh, important uh, points. Uh, first of all, yes, I, I was studying the, uh, the private merchant private, private ships, um, and um, the demographic growth in Venice uh, 
started in the late 15th century and go increasingly up. And there is, there you cannot sustain a, a, a city of more than 100,000 people with 21 ships. So uh, in the first decades of the 16th century, what Tenente calls a vacuum, there was created a vacuum, and you can see it in the legislation of the Council of Ten and the, and the uh, mm -hmm. commissioners of the grain, uh, they were calling every ship of every size, uh, of foreigners, Ragusians, come and bring us uh, so there were difficult years, uh, th that's for sure. There is uh, a general trend of uh, increase after 1544, <laughs> as I said, uh, and the city emerged more, and it's complex because it, there is uh, more ships that are invited, and more traders that are invited to Venice to do their trade, as a retaliation to, to privileges in Ancona that mm -hmm. Jews and, uh, and other merchants received. So, yeah, the, and, and, and Venice uh, accepts more, more ships uh, to be as Venetians. Uh, for example, Spanish ships for a certain time are considered as Venetians, and others get, receive the same privileges to be, uh, because the city needs some uh, merchandise. And um, yeah, that's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, I mean, there's much to do in this, uh, to see the, 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 the whole picture still. Um, I'm not sure if I... No, 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 it's okay. The rest of Italy has the air in affitto. But all of them. And the low cost of Yes, yes. So the property is the border. Other questions? President. Presidente Ortano. No, più che una domanda, è una conferma di quello che diceva Schreiner a proposito dell'atteggiamento che, che cambia o continua nei confronti dell'Adriatico. Eh, vorrei ricordare una cosa che sfugge abbastanza, cioè, eh, ne facevo cenno stamattina, la situazione di Comacchio. Di Comacchio si sa poco perché di scritto non c'è quasi nulla, ma quello che è stupefacente sono i risultati degli scavi archeologici, perché Comacchio è veramente un centro enorme, un investimento fortissimo e eh, viene raso al suolo e viene raso al suolo dopo molti tentativi da parte di Venezia, cioè eh, credo che eh, fosse un po' Uh, il segno di come Venezia sentisse ormai sua la responsabilità sull'Adriatico, prima ancora di arrivare a, a Bari per, nel mm. 1003 per stroncare l'assedio saraceno. Uh, gli uh, scavi che sono stati fatti sono stati fatti pensando molto al, così, a un'evoluzione del dell'entroterra eccetera invece probabilmente lo scatto è proprio la necessità da parte di Venezia che ci mette un mucchio di tempo di bloccare quello che poteva diventare un, un, un ostacolo nella rotta verso, verso il sud e la cosa interessante sulla base anche di quello che sentivo stamattina è che di Comacchio poi non se ne fa niente cioè la distrugge totalmente, ci sono uh, questi resti eh, scavati di recente eh, che sono impressionanti, che sono messi in, quasi in subordine rispetto all'evoluzione poco attenta al mare di quest'Italia, quest'area italica eh, così di retroterra eccetera eccetera. Invece io credo che abbiano proprio eh, la uh, funzione o che riescano a spiegarci come sia il progressivo crescere del ruolo di controllo di Venezia sull'Adriatico. Uh, sull poco per volta, poco per volta, poco per volta, fino a che non si distrugge totalmente. E quando si distrugge non si vuole ereditare nulla, cioè c'è proprio un annullamento significativo di quel versante, di quella costa, che mi pare sia molto coerente con la spiegazione eh, che eh, ci davi. Eh, 
mi pare. Non so se sei d'accordo. Ah, sì, funziona. No, ringrazio, eh, ti ringrazio per questa eh, informazione e vorrei eh, in genere aggiungere eh, a quello che ho detto, ci cioè ho detto troppo, almeno troppo lungo, ho parlato, ehm, eh, che ho, forse ho lasciato troppo fuori, anche in un certo senso per... Eh, perché non so, sono proprio esperta in questo eh, settore, eh, risultati eh, diciamo, non soltanto archeologici che tu, eh, eh, di cui tu hai parlato, eh, ma in genere eh, risultati topografici. Eh, io, io ho passato... La, la, in, questa, in questa conferenza unicamente a, a base di testi quasi unicamente a base di testi scritti ma io sono conscio che naturalmente anche eh, altre informazioni archeologici, topografici eccetera eh, dovrebbero essere prese in, in considerazione per completare eh, in senso positivo o negativo, eh? per completare eh, questa immagine eh, dello eh, sviluppo eh, veneziano. E naturalmente non è stato soltanto e esclusivamente eh, Bisanzio chi, eh, mh, chi eh, eh, è stato dietro, ma anche altri fattori. E forse nella, se, eh, se questi contributi, questi contributi eh, si stamperanno, io non lo so, poi naturalmente eh, se, eh, dobbiamo un po' prendere in considerazione, dovrei prendere in considerazione un po' anche altri, eh, altri argomenti di cui tu in quel momento hai parlato. Grazie. Sì, vorrei fare una riflessione, una domanda, non so, al professore Mal. Ehm, questa bella definizione cioè, del mare come spazio appunto di reti, che mi pare molto, molto pertinente, molto suggestiva, che tra l'altro mi pare risponda anche molto al discorso che si facevano stamattina sul Commonwealth veneziano, cioè anche lì siamo in una situazione molto simile di spazi di reti, di spazi di contatti, di spazi di mediazione. Però ecco dopo... Eh, eh, come dire eh, mh, leggo questo alla formula che lei ha citato cioè pro comodo mercatorum e tutilità dei nostri comuni cioè in questi spazi comunque sempre è prevaricante il mercato il commercio anche rispetto allo Stato e al Comune mi pare di capire o oh, come eh, cioè questa è un po' la domanda <ride> ecco mi <non> scelto <ride> Credo che ci, la, la formula si può interpretare nei due sensi, però torniamo al problema che, che era centrale per me, chi parla non sono i mercanti, è lo Stato e lo Stato è governato da patrici che sono la fetta superiore e che ne trae molti vantaggi del ceto mercantile. Per questo le curve che abbiamo avuto, nobili e non nobili, sono il complemento per una lettura anche critica di questo discorso di origine, di matrice unilaterale. Ma, però possiamo discutere, credo, per anni eh, su questo tema. Era soltanto da parte mia una piccola provocazione. No, I have um, a question and a comment to uh, uh, Dr. Dimitrov. Uh, first, maybe the, a small supplementary note. Uh, we think, and everywhere is written, that uh, the Black Sea was uh, before the Latin conquest uh, of Constantinople, a closed sea uh, for the emperor, for, for the 
Byzantine Empire. Now I remember, uh, and this is um, information not too concrete, uh, because I remembered only in the moment when you told about this, I discussed maybe 20 years ago or less uh, with David Jacobi, one of the uh, best uh, 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 of the best of us in uh, the knowledge uh, of uh, Venice, uh, Black Sea, and so on. And uh, I remember that uh, he told me that he found some informations about uh, Genoese in the Black Sea before the fall of Constantinople. And he, he wrote also, but in this moment, I don't know where, but I can find it. So because he said, and when, uh, when David Jacobi said something, it is quite absolutely true. Uh, and uh, he said that uh, this is a little bit a myth that it was completely closed. And so when we, uh, we can, uh, we have some, but I will find these informations and I hesitated a little bit to, uh, to give this comment uh, without uh, he, here, public, uh, here publicly this, co con uh, this comment without uh, knowing exactly where it is written. But there is some small information. Uh, yes, this was a comment and the other question. Uh, in uh, the Black Sea, uh, from the beginning uh, of the 13th century on, uh, and um, later still more, uh, we have uh, free nations. And I wonder, why you never mention, the, well, you, uh, you have spoken about Venice in the Black Sea, of course, that was the title. But uh, I am wonder that you never mentioned your own country, uh, Bulgaria. Uh, could, you, could you say something about uh, the uh, naval or commercial, naval and commercial importance of Bulgaria uh, in the 13th uh, century, maybe already before, because the Second uh, Bulgarian Empire was founded before the fall of Constantinople, but maybe we have no informations, but after we have informations, and this is, in my opinion, the third nation uh, of imp not too important role, but who is serving some role in the Black Sea in the 13th century. I give you know the possibility uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, to apostrophe a, a little bit also uh, your own country. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Schreiner. First for the comment, and second about the question. I had this topic in my paper, but I had to cut it before because the time was already finished. So thank you very much for this question. It's really that Bulgaria Tsardom or the Bulgarian Empire played a very important role and it's, it was one of the best allies of the Venetian Republic. Nevertheless, uh, the first contacts were uh, a bit uh, adversaries because Venice was the great defendant of the Latin Empire and the Bulgarian Empire was one of the main adversaries and rivals of the Latin Empire. So we have in 1257 a, a Venetian fleet consisting of 10 galleys which plundered the western Black Sea ports and especially in the Sebar or the town of Mesembria and took mm, the relics of Saint Theodore and brought them in Venice. But after that, from the very end of the 13th century, because the Gen Genoese took advantage 
in Black Sea being a bit uh, aggressive, prudent, as the Byzantine authors describe them in that way, particularly. The Venetians lost their advantage in the Black Sea and the Straits, and they have to find new allies, and they find such allies in the face of the Bulgarian Sardom, and we have only third consulates, Venetian consulates in the Black Sea. It's Trebizond, Tana, it's not exactly in the Black Sea, in the Azov Sea, and the third one, the third, the third one is in Varna. This was uh, the main port of the Bulgarian Sardom. We have Marco Leonardo, uh, the Venetian consul in Varna, and we have also a very important treaty uh, from 1347 between Venice and the Bulgarian Tsar Ivan Alexander, which was called the Imperator de Ozagora. And we have also the embassy of the famous Marino Folier before he mm, took the Doge and he was uh, ambassador of the Venetian Doge Andrea Dandolo. And he visited the Bulgarian Tsardom and made an appointment with the Bulgarian Tsar in Nikopo, another very important Bulgarian harbor on the the New River. So we have very intensive contacts between Bulgaria and Venice, and also Venice needed, hardly needed, the Bulgarian grain, the Bulgarian wheat, which was high quality and at the same time very cheap. And they bought, the Venetians bought it and then resell it. And as a matter of fact, it was a very important problem because we have the great famine in, in Western Europe in those days in the first quarter of the 14th century. So the grain and wheat were essential. And Bulgaria was one of the main exporters of grain and wheat and the Venetians took advantage of this. So Bulgaria and Venice were very reliable allies. And we have that um, treaty, Sacramento at Pato, uh, from 1347, between the Bulgaria Tsardom and the Venice, and the establishment of uh, the Venice Consulate in Varna, the third Black Sea Consulate, Venetian Consulate in the Black Sea area. Sì, sono soddisfatto. Altre domande? Il tempo... Bene, mi pare che la giornata sia stata proficua. Eh, abbiamo, sentito, abbiamo sentito delle ottime relazioni, abbiamo spaziato sul tema del mare. Io vorrei fare anche una domanda, ma la farò dopo. <ride> Se no... Maurice, eh, a questo punto ringrazio i relatori veramente per questo intenso pomeriggio, ringrazio tutti i presenti, eh, il convegno prosegue domani mattina con una terza sessione. Grazie a tutti, buonasera.